Every single nativity set includes three mysterious characters in flowing robes. The other three wise men, bringing gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh, they have traveled from the east to meet the baby Jesus. They come into the story from nowhere, and then they disappear again. Or do they? The Three Wise Men, or the Magi, or the Three Kings, are some of my absolute favorite characters in the Bible because they're mysterious and they are exciting. They have come from a foreign nation, somewhere far off in the east, and they have come all the way to Bethlehem to meet a king that they know has been prophesied because they have seen his star in the east and they have followed it all the way to Israel. As with most people mentioned in the New Testament, the church has more information about these three characters. The first of which is, that we call them by name. In Eastern Orthodox tradition, they are known as Melchior, Balthazar, and Caspar. These three names may not be as popular now as they once were in the English-speaking world, but in traditionally Christian countries, you will still meet people with these names. And these names are neither Greek nor Hebrew, the two main languages of the early church. The names Balthazar, Caspar, and Melchior are either Akkadian or Chaldean. The three men are often known as the Magi, a Latin word that literally means the magicians. Most scholars believe these three men to be Zoroastrian astrologers coming from the Eastern Persian countries. Zoroastrianism is one of the world's oldest continuous religions, and it actually already had, by this point, a connection with the people of Israel. Centuries before the birth of Christ, the people of Israel had been captured and taken to Babylon, where they were captives of the Babylonians. But the Babylonians were then conquered by the Persians, and the Persians were Zoroastrian. It was the Zoroastrian King Cyrus who allowed the people of Israel to go back and actually assisted them in rebuilding the temple in Jerusalem. And so here, in this situation, it is people of Cyrus's nation, Cyrus's people, that are coming to Israel to worship this new king. Zoroastrianism is very different to the religion of the Old Testament. It does, however, also await a Messiah. Zoroastrianism prophesied the coming of a Messiah. And when they travel there to Bethlehem, they are doing so with the knowledge that the Messiah that their religion has prophesied has arisen here in a religion very different to theirs. And this is an example of both their humility and their honest pursuit of truth, because it may not have been comfortable for many people to realize that your religion was actually pointing to a greater one and into another people. But they followed the truth wherever it led them, and it led them to the stable. The fact that their religion, which was so different to the one of God's chosen people, still led them to God incarnate shows a part of a repeating pattern of the seed of truth being planted in religions and cultures far removed from the one you traditionally know of as being part of the Bible. St. Seraphim of Sarov writes that even though it was not with the same power with which he appeared to the Hebrews, God nonetheless worked with pagan peoples. St. Seraphim writes, The presence of the Spirit of God also acted in the pagans who did not know the true God, because even among them God found for himself chosen people. Though the pagan philosophers also wandered in the darkness of ignorance of God, yet they sought the truth which is beloved by God. So you see, both in the holy Hebrew people and in the pagans who did not know God, there was preserved a knowledge of God. St. Paul pulled on this knowledge when he quoted from pagan poetry at the Areopagus when he preached about Christ in Athens. And the Magi pulled on this knowledge when they let it lead them to Jesus Christ. Christ had come to lead them to true knowledge, to complete their knowledge and their religion, and to connect with them directly. The Nativity Troparion, which is one of the main repeated hymns of Christmas in the Orthodox Church, and it dates back centuries, says this about the Magi and their search for truth through the star. Your nativity, O Christ our God, has shone upon the world the light of knowledge, for thereby they that worship the stars were taught by a star to worship you, the Son of Righteousness, and to know you, the day spring from on high. In your church you may hear the word day spring said as orient, but in either case it means a sunrise, a glorious dawning, a coming of light. With such a powerful story of journeying and following a star, arriving at a stable must have been quite a surprise to the Magi. They were expecting a palace, perhaps, and they even checked in the palace in Jerusalem to find Jesus. But there, in Bethlehem, at the stable, in the manger, they recognized Christ, our God. And they offered him three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now the church fathers see in these three gifts 
important symbolism and meaning connected to the grander story of the New Testament. Gold is used by kings and rulers to do the work of the kingdom. It also represents the beauty of wisdom and of truth. Frankincense is used by high priests in the worship of God. And myrrh is used by healers and physicians. Christ is king, he is the high priest, and he is the great physician. These three gifts are also offered to someone. Gold is given as tribute to a king. Frankincense is offered as a burnt offering unto God and myrrh is used to anoint the dead. These gifts are prophesying the crucifixion, which means they are prophesying also the resurrection of Christ. The gifts are to a king, a god, and a man, and Jesus Christ is all three. They give Christ their gifts and then they leave, and something has changed for them because Christ no longer needs to speak to them through a star. He can now speak to them directly because they are then told in a dream not by a star, to go home a different way. And this verse in which it says they went home a different direction is not just a throwaway verse. According to St. Gregory the Great, this verse is important for us to focus on. He writes that after we have come to the knowledge of Christ, we are forbidden to return the way we came. The lives of the wise men have been forever changed. But the story of the three wise men does not end here. In church tradition, we have further information about what happened to them. The three wise men returned to their homeland. There, they told everyone they knew about what they had seen in Israel, and they told everyone about the coming of the Messiah. Decades later, a mysterious traveler arrives there from the West. This traveler is surprised to hear of these three men's experience in the small town of Bethlehem, and he comes to them and says, do you want to know what happened to that little boy that you met? And they said, do you know? And he says, yes, I know exactly what happened. And he tells the Magi about Jesus Christ. He tells them of his life. He tells them of his ministry, his crucifixion and his resurrection. The three wise men have met the Apostle Thomas. He is traveling through their lands on his way to India. But he stops here long enough to teach them the gospel and to baptize the three wise men into Christ's holy church. The stories go on to say that the three wise men eventually went back to the Holy Land. They wanted to live out the rest of their earthly lives there in the land of their king. Eventually, they died and were buried there. In the middle of the fourth century, the remains of the three wise men were taken to the city of Milan in Italy. They traveled right across the empire on an ox cart, which is just about the slowest means of transportation that you could ever have. And this was so that the Christians living along their route could appreciate and enjoy the fact that the three wise men were traveling even further west across the Christian world. Their relics remained in the city of Milan for several centuries before eventually being moved to the cathedral in Cologne. This epic cathedral is one of the most famous landmarks in the world and their relics remain there. And as an aside, Cologne Cathedral has more to do with the grand Christmas folklore tradition because it was in Cologne during a nativity play that candy canes were invented for the children there. But did you ever wonder what happened to the three gifts? The stories tell us that parts of the gifts helped fund the family to make their way to Egypt where they were hiding from King Herod. But most of the gifts were kept by the Theotokos, Mary, her entire life. When she died, she left them to the church in Jerusalem. In around the year 300, these gifts made their way to Constantinople, where they remained for centuries. Eventually, when the Crusaders came from Western Europe, the Orthodox Christians of Constantinople hid the three gifts. They went from city to city before eventually making their way to safety on Mount Athos and a monastery there. The three original gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh have remained on Mount Athos ever since, and they are there to this day. Every now and again, these three gifts will leave the mountain and go to Orthodox communities around the world during the Christmas season. And it is widely reported that every now and again, this frankincense and myrrh from these gifts, despite centuries of recorded history, still emits a very powerful, beautiful scent. The gold is in the form of 28 individually meticulously crafted coins. Every single one has a different design. The gift of gold wasn't just a gift of monetary value, it was a gift of beauty, of effort, and worksmanship. The legacy of the Magi is probably even bigger than you think. Apart from being present in every single nativity set, Orion's belt, the constellation, is also known by many people as the Three Kings. In many Spanish-speaking countries, you don't go to a mall to get a photo with Santa Claus, you go to the mall to get a photo with one of the Three Kings. The Three Kings are celebrated every year on the 6th of January, the date of Epiphany or Theophany. 
and in many cultures this is another day, a miniature Christmas in which people receive gifts left to them not by Santa Claus but by the Three Kings. And there are many traditional recipes and pastries associated with the Three Kings and Epiphany. And in Orthodox churches to this day, the gifts of the Three Wise Men continue to be offered to Christ, because the beauty and the worksmanship of the gold is reflected in the censer, which is often at least painted gold. And inside the censer on the charcoal, we burn to this day a combination of frankincense and myrrh. So, if you ever want to know what scent the infant Jesus Christ experienced on that night hundreds and hundreds of years ago when he was visited by three mysterious travelers from the East, visit an Orthodox church for a service because the smell is exactly the same. Well, that was an exciting episode. I've been waiting a long time to do one on the Three Wise Men. I absolutely love them. And we do actually have real frankincense, real myrrh and uh, real chocolate gold coins here. And we've been saving a particular tea to have with this episode and it is a Persian black tea but it has been sweetened with a Persian rock candy called Nabat. Actually, do you, I'll take that. Crystallized sugar lightly flavored with saffron so it tastes very royal and very exciting and it has been a delicious tea and the perfect accompaniment to an episode on the three wise men. Done. Alright, that was exciting. Cut that. That's yep. one of my favorite episodes so far.